the module on confounding and bias, this is the lecture segment on bias due to uncontrolled confounding. So a definition of confounding is, it the, is when the causal relation between exposure and disease is distorted due to association of the exposure with other factors that influence the outcome. A shorter way of thinking about it is guilt by association. So research, observational research of human beings is confounding is absolutely rampant. I think that as we go through this and show you some examples that I've selected, um, you'll be able to think of examples from, from your experience as well. And you, you'll recognize having had heard this concept talked about in research. So an example, again, I'm going to this um, uh, Ken Rothman textbook um, because he has this very nice graphic that gives us an example and I hope illustrates the concept really clearly. So imagine that you were studying Down syndrome, whether Down syndrome is present in a child at birth. And um, one thing that someone might think about, okay, taking us back in time maybe, because with things you know now you might think not think of this, but you might think, well, could Down syndrome be affected by the birth order if the mother has had a number of other pregnancies and births before? Does that influence the risk of Down syndrome? So here are some data with the vertical axis being um, the proportion, uh, sorry, the, the prevalence per thousand live births of Down syndrome and the horizontal axis being birth order. And look at that. If you have a first, a, a baby is the first in birth order, um, the prevalence is only 0.6 per 1,000 live births, but by the time you get to the fifth or higher, it's 1.6 per 1,000 live births. But here's another piece of information that might have been collected in the same study. The prevalence of Down syndrome, the number of babies affected per 1,000 live births by maternal age. So among um, births when the mother was less than 20 years of age, um, the prevalence of Down syndrome is maybe like, let's call it 0.3 or 0.4 per thousand live births. By the time the mother is over 40, it's more than eight per thousand live births. Okay, so two interesting um, little graphics showing us um, some data and some potential association because we see this trend um, of two different variables with live births. So, um, but it might be occurring to you that, well, gee, the, mo the mother who is older probably frequently also has a, a more live births that, that have, the, the birth order of the baby is likely to be higher. The mother who's less than 20 is unlikely to have, be having a high birth order baby. So that is the potential confounding issue that these two variables potentially related to Down syndrome um, may also be related to each other. So how are we going to sort this out? We could, you know, we could wave our hands, we could talk about it in words, but if we're really going to address confounding, we need data, we need numbers, we need quantities. So the next slide um, shows now the two variables, birth order across the horizontal axis, and then now we've added a z-axis, which is the maternal age. So um, what, now, what, now what do we see here? So if we look at each category of maternal age, so the less than 20 at the front, um, and then we look at the prevalence of Down syndrome per thousand births, according to birth order, just among the group who are less than 20, so the row across the front, um, we are not seeing that birth order, that prevalence of Down syndrome is increasing with birth order across that category. Or if we skip all the way to the maternal age 40 plus at the back, um, we see, we, we, if you, and then looking from left to right with birth order, is, is the prevalence of Down syndrome with a birth order one at 40 plus any different from birth orders two, three, four, or five in the 40 plus age category? And I would say that it is not. So now if we change our thinking, we look from front to back. So if we look among birth order one, and we look at maternal age from 20 going up to 40 plus, now we are seeing a, a gradient. We are seeing an association, an increase in Down syndrome prevalence with maternal age um, in each category of birth order. So this graphic is an example of what I'm going to refer to as a stratified analysis. You've taken one variable of interest and your outcome, but then you have stratified the association according to another variable that is your potential confounder.
So what this is telling us is that the initial association that we saw where Down syndrome prevalence was going up with birth order was actually only the result of confounding by maternal age, and the true association is with maternal age. So this is probably fairly intuitive, but the key aspects that I want to mention here is that we had to have the data and we had to do the analysis in a certain way in order to get at the quantitative truth here. So we, we didn't just talk about the potential association of maternal age and birth order. We collected both of those variables and then we addressed them in our analysis. So in this case, this is what I would call a stratified analysis of essentially cross-classifying the two variables. So moving away from the one specific example to the more general concept of confounding, um, I'd like us to think, think, keep in mind that confounding depends on two conditions. The confounding exposure, and let's call it B, is associated with the exposure of interest, and let's call that A. So the conf and the second condition is that the confounding exposure B is associated with the disease outcome, and let's call that X. And the footnote is that those associations should be causally and causal and independent associations. So the second bullet, that the confounding exposure is associated with the outcome, is, again, fairly intuitive. You'll hear people raising their hands at conferences and say, you know, well, you're interested in outcome X, but what about all these other, you know, potential things that are associated with outcome X? Did you account for those in your study? Um, so the second bullet is fairly intuitive where confounding is, is because confounding occurs when you have another exposure that's associated with disease outcome. But let's always keep in mind the first bullet, that the confounding exposure is associated with the exposure of interest. So maternal age and birth order are associated with each other. It's very few uh, women in, who are less than 20 were having five children, but women over 40, it, it, there's a higher probability that's going to be their fifth child. And so um, both of those conditions actually have to be present for confounding. If only one of them is present, a, a, another exposure can be strongly associated with the disease outcome. But if it's not associated with your exposure of interest A, it's actually not going to be a confounder. All right, so how could the confounding exposure be and the disease be associated? So some possible mechanisms are, are chance, which is um, not a causal association. The second bullet is that the confounding exposure B is a cause of the disease itself. And that's usually the most obvious one that people think of, is that, that your other causes of whatever your outcome is. Um, Another possibility, number three, is that the exposure is an effect of the disease. So whatever this, this potential confound, this, this other exposure or variable that you've collected is, is present more frequently in the disease population than the non-diseased. But is that because it happened after they had disease? After they had the disease, they started using this other medication. After they had the disease, they started having low physical activity because they didn't feel well. After they had the disease, something else changed in their life, right? After they had lung cancer, they started smoking. So number three, if that's, the, if that's what's happening, that would not be an example of a confounder. In fact, number three would actually be an example of not correctly setting up your, your epidemiologic study and collecting your data because you're trying to collect exposures that were present before disease, not ones that are present after. And, um, Another possible association is number four, if some other variable causes both. And in human populations, this is, um, this is you know, very common, that patterns of you know, behaviors and situations in people's lives and their socioeconomic status, there's just a whole lot of things about their health and their diet and their health behaviors and their health care that end up being all associated with each other um, often through socioeconomic status or other cultural factors. So you, you may not always see, uh, see an obvious and intuitive cause and effect between your confounder and your outcome, but yet there may, be, there may be one. Okay, and then number five is that the confounding exposure B influences detection of the disease. So it doesn't influence the disease itself, but influences whether the person participates in screening or influences whether the person is... Um, is seen and diagnosed with this condition. So some examples. So, so these little diagrams, um, people who like theoretical like to call these di directed acyclic graphs. Um, 
the thing to keep in mind is that the, the solid arrow is an assumed or presumed causation, and then the dotted arrow, I'm, I'm, dot, I'm making it a broken line for your hypothesized cause and effect. So if you're interested in whether smoking behavior causes some disease, so smoking behavior A causes disease X, um, you, you might think about what other um, potential confounders B are associated with disease X. So suppose that your, um, your, you, that um, drinking alcohol also cause, is a cause of disease X. Um, the, so there may be con potential confounding between smoking and drinking alcohol, um, not because one of those causes the other, but because there's a potential common cause, genetic um, you know, addiction type of genes or psychological and cultural factors, because um, it is true in most data sets that I've ever seen that the prevalence of smoking is higher among people who drink alcohol, and there's a good population of people who do, who report neither of those things. So this exposure, again, is not because A or B are causes of each other, but because they have a common cause. So, that, so that's one classic example of confounding is where two different factors that are associated through, through sort of cultural and social factors um, are both causes of a disease and may confound each other. Um, the more straightforward maybe is that when one exposure causes the other exposure. So here, if we are interested, our hypothesis is that treatment A causes a bad outcome of whatever disease X. Um, the potential confounder is when the decision is made what treatment, so if there are two if there are two potentially useful treatments for, con for, for a disease and um, the, the patient and the physician are discussing which one, um, this is where confounder B comes into play. If the patient is sicker, if the patient is, um, has other health conditions such that they're not a good candidate for surgery, then the non-surgical treatment might be selected. Um, if the patient has certain other health conditions certain me medications might be contraindicated. So if we were going to just naively say, okay, let's look at treatment A, yes or no, and see if, see if treatment A actually resulted in a, in a bad outcome for these patients, that would be the na naive way to do a study. And, and there's all sorts of you know, ways to get electronic data nowadays and do that. But if you didn't account for the factors B that might explain why some patients got one treatment and, or some patients got another, if those factors B are also contributing to the bad outcome, then your study is going to be confounded. So in fact, this is something that I bet each of you can think of examples of, and we're going to have a discussion assignment asking you to give an example of where, um, where two different treatments, the selection of two different treatments is probably related to the, the health of the patient or other characteristics of the patient that might contribute to uh, the association between treatment and outcome as confounders. All right, so in this um, diagram, I've created a new situation where we have A, your exposure of interest, and X, your outcome of interest, and I've put B in between them. So this would show that A is causing B, and then B is causing X. So the question here is, in this diagram, taking it at face value, is A a cause of X? And I'm going to say yes. A by causing B is causing X. If A was not present, then B would not be present, and then X would not be present. Well, if we were a literal one-to-one -one relationship. In terms of epidemiology and multiple causes, I'm going to say the presence of A causes B to be more likely, which causes X to be more likely. So yes, the presence of A does cause X to be more likely. So if B is entirely caused by A, and if A has no effect on X without B, then B would, we would describe B as being in the causal pathway between A and X and not a confounder. So this phrase causal pathway is something we're going to throw into the discussion when we're talking about potential confounders. So if, if A causes X through B, that does not make B a confounder. That makes B in the causal pathway. In fact, if you in your analysis treated B as a confounder, the association between A and X would go away. But actually, 
I'm arguing that A really is a cause of X here and that by treating B as a confounder, you would be falsely removing, you would be obscuring the effect of A because it would all be attributed to B. And when you have some, some real data and some data analysis with um, different ways of controlling for confounders, this may be more clear to you, but right now you have to take it, on, uh, take it from me on faith that if you treat some, this, this variable that's in the causal pathway as a confounder, you can seriously bias your data. So how would we, so I've drawn this, I drew it, A causes B causes X there. But in real data or in a real study, how would we know whether this is true? And there's actually not very much about the data that would tell you that. This is one of these, what um, causes what? You'd have to look at other external, um, what does the literature say about the relationship between A and B? What does the literature say about the relationship between B and X? Because they can be associated in your data and it's not, it won't be clear which causes which. So this is why um, observational studies always have to involve an element of bringing, you know, use, involving people who know something about the subject matter, know about the other literature on causal relationships for these diseases that you're studying, and decide whether something is, in, is like, more likely to be a confounder or more likely to be in the causal pathway. So these are discussions that you have to have external to your data. Your data are not going to answer that for you. So let's take another example. Now I have A, your exposure of interest. Your question is whether A causes X. But suppose there's a variable B that causes A. And B also has some independent contribution to causing X. Um, so in this example, if the exposure of interest is caused by B, but your, again, your question is about A, if you want to describe the independent effect of A beyond that of B on X, then B may be treated as a confounder, in fact, should be treated as a confounder. So part of this whole issue of confounding is exactly how you define your question. So, um, so if your question is the effect of A on X, then B should be treated as a confounder. And again, this is one of the other um, possible associations. And again, looking at your data, all three, of the, uh, all three of these would look the same. A would be associated with X, A would be associated with B, B would be associated with X. But if this was the true causal pathway, if, if someone with some knowledge of this situation or knowledge of the way the data was collected said, oh, you know, all these Bs, they really happened after disease, they, this exposure changed, people changed their exercise habits, they started smoking whatever after the disease, then that is also not a confounding situation. So if exposure B is caused by disease X, it's not a confounder of the association between A and X. So again, these three possible situations, these would all look the same after you collected the data. If you collected A, B, and X, um, how would you know? So first of all, we want to have good study design and know for sure that A and B were present before X. And that way we know that the last one is not a possible explanation, A, X causing B. If we have good study design and good data and correct data collection, that should not be the case. And then it really takes subject area knowledge of whether A causes B or vice versa to, term, to distinguish between those first two. Because again, in your data, they're just both going to be associated with each other. So another concept about confounding that I just want to make sure that we talk about is that confounding can affect the estimate in either direction. So uncontrolled confounding can be responsible for finding no association when in fact there is a true association or finding an association when in fact there is no true association. So the second one is what we hear more commonly talked about. Some study reports an association between A and X and people are writing letters to the editor they didn't account for B. That's, you know, and, and we think there's no true association. That association would go away if they accounted for B in their study. So, so that is the common, you know, the common recognition and intuitive recognition of confounding. But I just want to remind you that the first one also happens, that there are studies where you, that might not find an association when in fact there was a true association, but some confounder that, that affects disease in the opposite direction is actually obscuring it. So the properties of a confounder in terms of, of data is that your data will tell you whether the two conditions, association with the exposure and association with the outcome are present. But the only way to assess whether the factor is in the causal fact 
in, in the causal pathway is to use your judgment or to use some subject area knowledge. So I'm making up a hypothetical example here. And so suppose that we were interested in two different treatments for kidney disease, dialysis or kidney transplant. And we want to know which, what, which one is better for the survival of our patients. And we're going to be naive and say, oh, look at all these great electronic medical record data that we have. We're just going to pull in all those data and we're going to find which of these treatments is better. And so, you know, probably people actually already know this, but I'm just trying to make up a simple example. And you probably have examples in your own field where there are two different treatments available for, for some condition and, um, and there may not have ever been randomized trials and physicians may have their own preferences. And there is the interest in looking at observational data, looking at experience over years and seeing how, how those patients are doing, right? So even though this is a naive example, it is related to questions that people um, often have. Okay, so suppose these are my these are my counts of patients in each of the categories, dialysis and transplant, each have 500 patients. And at the end of the study, 100 of the dialysis patients are dead and only 50 of the transplant patients are dead. So we could say that they have a mortality rate or a mortality experience of 20, mortality proportion of 20 per 100 in the dialysis group and 10 per 100 in the transplant group. Well, there we go. In our naive study, we've got a relative risk of two. Um, you know, dialysis is leading to more deaths than transplant. Okay, remember I'm making up these data. I have no idea. Okay, but could there be potential confounders affecting the association that we're observing here? So again, I'm going to return to my idea that what patient, what treatment is chosen for a particular patient in observational data is not randomized. It is going to be related to some characteristics of that patient, whether it's their, their health conditions, their insurance status, whether it's the preference of the doctor that they happen to see. So this is not a randomized study, so we have to think about potential confounders of the, di of the dialysis and transplant association with mortality. So I'm, so, so I'm going to do, again, this concept of stratified analysis. So suppose I can, I'm concerned that comorbidities or other illnesses present in the patient are potential confounders. So now I'm stratifying the same data from the previous slide into two categories of this confounder, patients who have two or more co comorbidities and patients who have zero or one comorbidities. Okay, I'm totally making this data up, but still I assign them in these cells to add up exactly to what I had in the previous slide. Okay, there's still 500 dialysis and 500 transplant, and there's um, the same number of deaths in the dialysis and transplant group, but now I've broken them out according to my imaginary comorbidity variable. All right, so now among the patients with two or, more, two or more comorbidities, we have 85 deaths out of 300 patients in dialysis and 10, 10 deaths out of, four, out of uh, 45 patients in transplant. And that's actually giving us an, a risk ratio very close to one. There's actually no difference in mortality by treatment in this stratum of our data. And then I go over to those who have no or one comorbidities and um, so what I'm imagining is that transplant, you notice I'm imagining that transplant is very infrequently selected for a patient with a lot of other comor comorbidities and health problems. And most of the transplants actually occurred in the patients with no or one comorbidities, right? So this is my imaginary data and I'm free to imagine that. Okay, so we've got, now we've got 455 transplant patients in the zero or one comorbidity group, but I'm gonna say only 40 of them died and in the dialysis group, we have 215 of them died. And so 15 out of 200 compared to 40 out of 455. Um, now I have a risk ratio of 0 0.85, or again, very close to one. So from the same data that in the previous slide gave us a risk ratio of two in the crude or naive analysis, when we do this stratified analysis, in each of these strata, there really is no association between treatment choice and mortality. Okay, I made up these data, but real data, this can happen. There can be a confounder that's so important, some factor that, that drives the choice of treatment, that if, that if that factor that drives the choice of treatment is also associated with the survival, then it may look like one treatment is much superior to the other. But actually, what can also be true, now I'm making up a new set of stratified analysis. I'm, I made up these data so I can, I can make up another scenario. 
I still have transplant more frequently being selected for the patients with zero or one comorbidity. Now it's 400 and 100. Um, but I, I move the deaths around because that's my prerogative because I'm making up these data. But this is a real thing that could happen. So the same data from the first slide with a risk ratio of two are still here and I've just stratified them out differently. So this time I've made up a scenario where the relative risk among those with two or more comorbidities turns out to be 1.5, and the relative risk of, among those with zero or one turns out to be 1.6. So my point here, scenarios one and two are both consistent with our intuition about comorbidities, that patients with a lot of comorbidities may not be good candidates for transplant and therefore are staying in the dialysis treatment group. But scenarios one and two would lead to different inference about the causal effect of dialysis on survival. So in scenario one, all the association between treatment and mortality went away in our stratified analysis. In scenario two, there was still an association, although it was not as strong as we saw in the original or crude analysis. So my moral here is that we need data and not just intuition to distinguish between those scenarios. So the people who stand up in a conference and say, but what about you know, vari variable B? I don't think you accounted for that. And therefore, I think that the results you've shown are, are you know, I'm just going to dismiss them because you didn't collect variable B. So you as the investigator have to have anticipate that guy and you have to collect variable B and you have to do the analysis. And it's possible that even after taking into account variable B, there still is an association between A and X. So the confounding variables, um, how are you going to avoid or control for or adjust for potential confounders? So at the study design stage, you can randomize, yes. If you, if you have the opportunity to do a randomized trial, the best way to address confounding is to randomly assign your treatment or exposure. But not having that opportunity, other design options are to match or construct study groups that are comparable on the levels of confounder. So I'm just going to express a little caveat about matching. Um, it, that is, again, a very good intuitive way to get rid of confounding. If you match your patients exactly on age, you match them exactly on comorbidity, you match them exactly on a lot of things, that is a way to address confounding. The problem is it's actually very hard to carry out a study by finding patients who match exactly on things. So there's other statistical ways to address confounding that don't require you to go out and seek that exactly matching patient. And then there's restriction or limiting the study groups to a narrow range of the confounder. So um, in the, then after you have designed your study and collected the data, in the data analysis stage, there's a lot of things that you can think about in terms of addressing confounding. Most of these kind of beyond the scope of this course, so I'm just kind of mentioning here, we're not gonna learn them or, or practice them very much, except possibly we might get into some stratification. Um, so stratification is, is the example that I just showed you um, where you take your two variables and you create categories cross-classifying your, your study participants and their outcomes on those two variables. Um, standardization is another term that you'll see sometimes. Computing a summary estimate across categories, um, it's usually used to account for age. We often see age standardized rates compared. Um, adjustment by mantle hansel um, uh, calculation, we'll see that, you'll see that in the methods of papers sometimes. That is without actually showing you like the graphic with the, with the birth order and the maternal age, that's a statistical way that they have actually done that stratified analysis. Um, multivariable regression is, a, is another way and really the most common way that we'll see nowadays of um, taking into account confounding. And then there's, um, if you have matched your participants, you have to conduct a matched analysis. So just an example of adjustment by multivariable regression. Um, this, these are an, a study of um, birth defects association with antifungal drug use and um, I picked this example because they actually showed in the, in the table, in the paper that they published, which covariates they included in the regression model. That is to say, what things they treated as potential confounders. So they have um, antifungal drugs as their exposure of interest A, but they have several different subtypes on this table of birth defects. So outcome X is different. And so what I, what I want to point out here is that 
the choice of covariates or the potential confounders they found they needed to address would differ according to the outcome. So there's a whole bunch of them apparently for neural tube defects, but those same things are not potential causes of spinal bifida, so that list is shorter. Um, so when people say they've done multivariable analysis, there's still the whole conversation, the whole thinking through of what did you include? You know, is this associated with the exposure? Is this associated with the outcome? How does it affect our data? And again, those are things when you get further on in your, in your training and learn more statistics that this multivariable analysis will be more clear to you. Um, okay, another example, and this is a, a paper about whether aspirin or non-aspirin NSAID drugs are associated with lung cancer incidence. So in the study of association between aspirin and lung cancer, um, the initial analysis in the left-hand column, the first column, it um, is adjusted only for age, and they find that people who use aspirin six or more times weekly have a hazard ratio of 1.34 for lung cancer compared to people who never use aspirin. Hmm, so aspirin is causing lung cancer? Let's think about that further. What are some things that could be both related to lung cancer incidence and aspirin use? Well, how about cigarette smoking? And here's why, not directly. Well, possibly, yeah. So, so smoking does not cause you to use aspirin and aspirin does not cause you to smoke, but people who smoke do have a higher risk and prevalence of, of heart problems. And so a fair proportion of the people who smoke may have been advised to take a, a daily aspirin. So accounting for smoking, so the center column is column B. So the multivariable adjusted now takes into account smoking and that hazard ratio has dropped from 1.34 to 1.21 by accounting for smoking and some of these other variables. And then on the far right on column C, it's adjusted further for history of heart disease and heart or heart attack. So now we see the people who use aspirin six or more times weekly, that is to say daily, have essentially a null association, 1.08 hazard ratio with lung cancer. So thinking about it, smoking probably contributes to, smoking does contribute to heart disease, smoking does contribute to lung cancer. And so further, if we account not only for smoking itself, but also the actual presence of heart disease, which is probably related to heavier smoking or longer term smoking, um, now we are seeing that the association is, is completely disappearing. So again, multivariable analysis, you gotta read the footnotes of the tables and see what are they adjusting for. So randomization is the only option that can deal with unrecognized and unmeasured confounders. So again, if you have the opportunity to do a randomized study, you know, you should do that and congratulations. But for the rest of us who don't have that opportunity, we always have to acknowledge there may be unmeasured confounders in our data, but we have to make our, the best effort that we can as researchers to design our study and to collect data, to collect data about all the potential confounders. So in summary, um, we've talked about confounding and the, and the intuitive importance of other variables that are related to your outcome but perhaps less intuitive, but something to think about is, are those other variables also related to your exposure of interest? And the main thing I wanna emphasize about confounding is that you have to address confounding in your study by collecting data, measuring those variables that are potential confounders because of how they quantitatively affect your association. You need to actually collect the data and have it in your data set.